Frank Saravalli joining us now, brought to you by the VGH Millionaire Lottery. You have until midnight, Friday, December 22nd, to get in on 51 early bird draws in the VGH Millionaire Lottery. These early bird draws are worth more than $200,000. Win an Audi e-tron GT or a private jet experience that includes 20 grand in cash or $125,000 plus 50 winners will win one thousand with your vgh millionaire lottery tickets you get in to win one of 10 grand prize options or you can take 2.7 million dollars in tax-free cash don't forget to get your 50 50 plus tickets every ticket purchase supports vgh and the ubc hospital foundation order in person at london drugs or online at millionaire lottery.com 19 plus play know your limit play within it frank have you ever won the lottery in any form scratch off anything like that just tw- 20 bucks doesn't count on the scratch off, does it? I think so. I think anything above like 10 on a scratch off is like you have won the lottery. We, uh, I used to be like a degenerate scratch off player. Nice. Like I would go to the car wash and while waiting for my car, I'd buy like a hundred bucks in scratch off tickets and just feverishly be sitting there scratching away waiting for it. And the most you ever won was $20? Yeah, I mean, I a ton of like free. You got a free ticket. You got a free. That doesn't count. <laughs> no, By the way, I was thinking about the prizes. How amazing it would it be if the private jet experience was on Francesco Aquilini's private jet, and you could ask him anything you wanted. What would you ask Francesco Aquilini if you could ask him anything you wanted? I'd ask him what it feels like to finally get things right. It seems you've got some people in place that are doing all the right stuff. It's taken you a while to get to this point. How do you find a way to keep that going? And by the way, the reason what made me think of that is when I was, pro- how old are you, Quads? 23. And Harm? 23. <laughs> so almost exactly your age, I pitched a story of flying on Flyers owner Ed Snyder's private jet with him. And they said yes. And I did it when I was 23. And it was like two or three of the coolest days of my life. Okay, well, now we need to hear stories about that because I've never heard about this. Tell us about it. It was unreal. Like, they just, uh, he was getting inducted into the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. He had already been in the Big Boy Hockey Hall of Fame for a while as a builder. And I sort of pitched the idea of, like, writing a story about what his legacy will end up being long beyond when he's gone. And now he's he passed away six, seven years ago now. And... It's still like, it was amazing to get access to him and his family. We flew to, from Philly to Chicago. Uh, I was with him all day during the induction, uh, the party afterwards. Then the next day, woke up and flew from Chicago to Washington and met the Flyers. Uh, and they played a game there against the Caps. And uh, it was just a like, kind of amazing behind the scenes experience. That's legendary. I, I would, I mean, hey, we're 23. We're in that prime age that Frank was in when he did that story. Maybe we have to pitch it. Uh, you talked about him getting things right as owner of the Vancouver Canucks. I think one of those things is hiring Jim Rutherford as the president of hockey operations. His contract is up at the end of this year. Uh, all we've heard is that they're going to work on an extension. What's the sense you get there? And what do you think of the job that Rutherford's done as a whole since he became president uh, two years ago now? I think it's been pretty good in the sense that there, there's been a lot for them to work through, right? Um, there's been, uh, I don't want to say turmoil, but there was a lot of stuff to pick through to get to where they are now. On the ice, removing some contracts that were really problematic. Off the ice, hiring the right people, putting the right process in place, reducing a lot of the noise that existed around the team. I think... The situation that had unfolded with Bruce Boudreaux, um, who was hired by the owner, like that was a clear misstep um, that I think it took them a while to mop up. And I know fans don't like hearing that because they got so attached to Bruce Boudreaux, but I think that path that the Canucks went down really took them a while to dig out from and, and get the right person in place in Rick Tockett. And, you know, I wrote a story last week, a column that grabbed uh, some Canucks fans attention when I had said that Patrick Alvine deserves some consideration already as one of the front runners for GM of the year. And I felt kind of bad about the singular attention that that seemed to place and focus on Patrick Alvine, because the truth is, if you really understand how the Canucks front office works, 
a big part of the aggression that they've shown has actually come from Jim Rutherford specifically. And he's really been one of those people that's been pushing this team to continue to evolve and improve and get better. And I don't know that as president of hockey ops, you, you don't necessarily get the credit. There's no president of hockey ops. There's no POHO award at the end of the year <laughs> at the NHL awards. So he, he may not get some of that credit, but when you talk about his contract and where things stand, having the chance to, to get to know Jim a little bit over the years, like this is not something that's occupying much of his time. I don't think, or, or headspace. Uh, he's accomplished so much with the Stanley cups that he's won the pile of money that he has in the bank. Um, I, I don't think he's sweating over his security. I think one thing that's really stood out to him is I think this has been Vancouver has been a really good fit for his family. And I think that part of it has also re-energized him a bit, so to speak behind the scenes. Frank, with this outstanding start, the Canucks have had which players reputation around the league has had the uh, biggest glow up, uh, whether it be a Brock Bess or a, a Quinn Hughes, considering uh, how many people used to perceive his defensive game, uh, a JT Miller, considering how that contract extension was often discussed last year, uh, whether it's a Philip Peronik, uh, what are you hearing outside of Vancouver in terms of who's, who's catching uh, people's eyes? I think the easy answer would be Brock Besser because the goal scoring, if you had told me on December 13th, and I know that he's played a couple more games, so it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but that Brock Besser and Austin Matthews would be tied in the league lead in scoring with 21 goals this year. I would have said you're insane. Um, this start to the season has been magical for Besser. And there's no doubt about that, uh, how good he's been, how they've just hit the back of the net for him. It's been wild to see, but I'm going to go outside the box and I'm going to say if it counts as outside the box, cause you mentioned his name, but I'm going to say JT Miller. Because there was so much negative attention focused around the you know the potential trade and how close it actually did get to Pittsburgh, which was pretty darn close. Um, the contract extension and how that seemed to be looming over the Canucks' heads. And then to come back this year and not just score and produce the way that he has, which has been excellent, but I really get the sense in talking to some Canucks players that are in the room on a daily basis that see everything. He's really part of the core fabric of this team and the heartbeat of it from a personality perspective that um, I think the Canucks are, are thrilled with that development and to see where he fits. You look at his production now and you say, oh, that contract, maybe the last couple of years might not be very friendly, but right now we're okay with it. Frank, what does Philip Ronick's next contract look like? That's the big question that we've been asking lately. What does his next contract look like? I think it's a number that starts with an eight all day long. Hmm. Um, I, I just like look at look at what he's on track to produce this year. And then let's just like game theory this out, okay? Because I I started to dive into this a little bit with the S P guys. We didn't fully go ham on it. Let's do it. If you were to have Philip Ronick, just again, pure hypothetical game theory, go to arbitration this summer after a, I don't know, call it, let's say on the lower end, based on where he's trending now, 70 points. Mm -hmm. Like it's not 85, it's not 75. Let's call it 70. Let's say he finishes at 70. Then you look at the minutes played. Then you look at his importance to the team. Like, uh, just go pure arb stats. Like, where yeah. does he end up? It's it's north of seven million bucks, I think, on a one year deal. So, so if yeah, if, continue, continue. So if you were to like then extrapolate that out further and say, okay, he's somewhere seven or north on a on a one year arb deal to then purchase UFA deals, which is how the, the NHL marketplace works. And then take the term and add that into it. Like you're, you're, you're again, I think you're looking in the eights all day long. Do you think the Canucks should pay that? Because that's where we start to have the hangups is we've seen different times where Philip Roenick's defensive game doesn't look great. 
loses some 50-50 uh-huh. battles, and I'm not trying to poke holes in the guy's game like I was with Leo Patterson last week when we had you on the show, but should the Canucks be paying Philip Aronik? Quinn Hughes' partner is going to make more than Quinn Hughes? They're arriving at this juncture at different points. Mm-hmm. Hughes' deal purchased a bunch of RFA years. This deal purchases UFA deals also at a time when the cap is going up. And this is why you guys can't have nice things is because (laughs) you guys are starting to poke holes at his game saying, well, we, you know, should we pay 8 million bucks a year? My answer is just go back and listen to Quinn Hughes answer from the start of the season when he said point blank. It also may have been a, slight knock at the Canucks, even though I'm not sure that he meant it that way. This is the best player I've ever played with here. Remember when he yep. said that? I do. And up until last year, that player was like Chris Tanev and Ethan Bear. So that, well that's so that's right. why you could say that it's an underhanded, you know, blow to the Canucks of what they've put next to him. Or you could look at it from a different perspective, which is the one that I would choose, which is Quinn Hughes has had a magical season. He's done it for the most part next to Philip Aronik. That person, that player, who, by the way, on his own two feet is having a, again, 70-plus point season most likely, that person's worth their weight in gold if he makes your star defenseman shine even brighter, if he has a, 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 a partnership, a tandem working together that is, is seemingly... Um, going swimmingly for lack of a better term. Why like why bleep with happy? Yeah. The 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 scenario we kind of kept laying out was okay, you're gonna get a chance to see what Philip Ronick looks like away from Quinn Hughes once Ethan Bear signs, which everybody in the market thought was going to happen. Jim Rutherford was on Donnie and Dolly this morning and he pointed out or he said, Yeah, we really thought he was coming back. And he spoke about we thought Ethan Bear was coming back. It looks like Bear is going to sign a two year deal in Washington, it looks like the Canucks are out on that. How much of a wrench does that throw in the Canucks' plan that they don't get Ethan Bear at this juncture? I personally would not have been banking on that idea um, solely because I think that's how you get yourself into big trouble is trying to wedge one player to play with another and hope and pray and wish that it works out. Again, let me take you back to what I just said. Don't bleep with happy. It's working. I know that you want, and and at some point, everyone is going to want, hey, let we've got to see Philip Peronic play on his own two feet and carry a pair and continue to produce at the same rate that he has in order for us to all feel satisfied about potentially paying him that kind of money. I, I sit back and I say, just, just let the magic unfold. Just, just enjoy what you have and how good it's been and say, this is our pairing for the next seven years or whatever the number ends up being, that we can just enjoy this. Frank, I wanted to ask you about Andre Kuzmenko's future uh, scores uh, last night, which must be great for his confidence. But given that Rick Tockett seems reluctant to trust him defensively, how do you think the Canucks feel about Kuzmenko's fit on the roster you know, not only for this season, but he's got another year left on his contract as well. Yeah, I think it's a really tough spot to be in because, you know, I, I think I've seen the reports of Kuzmenko's name being out there. I think we all understand that this year has sort of been like square peg in a round hole uh, in terms of his fit under Rick Tockett. And it's clear to me that, I don't even know if trust is is the right word, but there's there's some disconnect there between player and coaching staff that I don't know that those things ever really get rectified. Like, And I don't know if it's possible to put it all back together again, but I think it's in the Canucks' best interest to try because you think back to his season last year and, and how ridiculous that production was um, and the success that he found basically as free money for the Canucks. This was always kind of the risk that you have a great rookie season in the NHL. Everyone wants to see how it translates to North America and you get the answer and it's amazing. 
And then you sign him to a commitment that it's not, the term isn't obviously too tough to handle, but it's at a way bigger chunk than he was last year. That if things don't go well, you're backed into this corner and spot. And look, I think it's been uncomfortable. Um, I think it would also be a mistake right now to trade him when his value seems to be pretty low as opposed to trying to rehab this a bit more. You still in on uh, Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor? I got eliminated yesterday. I got eliminated yesterday. I took the Yotes to beat the Pens, and that didn't hmm. happen. So I'm looking at it. As far as I can tell, the Penguins beating the Coyotes was the only thing that happened yesterday. Out of all the picks that anybody could have made, Pittsburgh beating the Coyotes was the only one. So there are not many. There's 58 people left in the game this week. We've well, seen. That, that's that's what I was gonna say. It's been a, an absolute slaughter. I, I say I think there's 38 left. Me and yeah, you're right. It is 38. Me and 47 percent of people yesterday picked Florida to get 30 shots on goal. The 29.5 or over uh, shots on goal, and we all got eliminated. And like I said, there's not many Six. people left. 6.7% of the pool remains. I'd say this Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor game is no joke. No, it's not. Got to be ready to go. Got to be on your toes. Just like when you get Elias Pettersson five-on-five five play questions like we threw at you last week. I, I, like, I, I, I truly didn't know what you wanted. Like, what was like what was the correct answer here? I'm like, does this guy want me to come in and start beating Pettersson with a mallet? Like, what? Like, do you like what like guys have stretches in a season where like you're just not everything is simpatico like let's you know big picture guys stay out of this is this is so vancouver stop it <laughs> all right frank thanks for joining us we'll uh we'll be sure to throw you some some fastballs next week as well sounds good canucks conversation with Harmon and quads every weekday at 2 p.m be sure to check it out on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. And if you missed it, go check it out on your favorite podcast catcher app.